going to stand down here and try and see if you can hear me from. Can everyone hear me? Is this uh, yep. a good place? Okay, just to give you a sense of orientation of things, the river runs from that end of the building and out that end of the building. The centre of the channel is where that scaffold pole is. So you've got the bank of the channel up there and it's dropping down. And we've lost half the river to the quarry on that side. Okay? The channel itself is basically is, is sort of described or bounded by this continuous row of posts, this palisade, which you can see running through there all the way along, continues to go right around to where that open door is up on the far side. And if you turn round, you see it continuing behind you. And again, encapsulating the channel going back up to the So that's our reposing boundary. And that dates to somewhere between 1000 and 800 BC. And in the centre of it, we've got a series of raised structures. So can you see this group of vertical posts in front of me? We mark them with yellow flags. They form a circle. You can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten down here. So what you're seeing is a Bronze Age rind house standing at stilts, basically. And then to give you the roof of that structure, can you see the spokes in the wheel banning around just here? That's the roof of the structure built over a watercourse that's caught fire and then has collapsed and dropped down into the sediment of the channel. So all the verticals are unburnt and all the horizontals are charred. So as well as having the roof, we've also got the walls, we've also got potentially the floors, but equally we've got all of the materials that are caught within the settlement itself. So we're finding, in pristine condition pretty much, we're finding pots, textiles and tools and crown stones and all of the sort of fixtures and fittings of these structures. So this is the, our sort of, our analogy is our Pompeii of the Fens, I suppose, in the sense that we're not looking at some sort of great volcanic event, but we are looking at a settlement that's been caught by a catastrophe that has sort of frozen the moment in time for us. So despite being 3,000 years old, we're perhaps witnessing something that happened in a few hours and caught this for us. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, for example, where the guys are excavating at the moment, we're finding, see, see these very pale wood chips going around the outside? These are the construction, these are wood chips coming off as they're sharpening these posts to insert them into the channel to build these structures. Inside of that we've got, can you see just down here, we've got the, the fragments of lamb bones. We've got one-year-old lambs that have been butchered, they've been cleaved down the spine and separated in two parts, ready to be cooked, to be eaten. We've got deer and pig bones going around the outside of the building as if they've just been butchered and chucked outside. And when Lizzie and Dan are working, we're getting textiles. We're finding the clothes and the drapes and the baskets and things like that from inside that second. And I'll show you in a minute. We've got from this quarter of the river, we're starting to find their pots and their wares as well. So there's a, it's the most complete picture that we've ever had of a, of a Bronze Age settlement. And here it is preserved within this channel. And you'd notice that when you came onto site, you walked down a slope. So remember, we took away two metres of sediment before we started hand excavating down into this. So its appearance of being close to the surface is an illusion. It's all about that deeply buried context. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right, I'm going to show you some of the, the sort of details and discoveries of this site. But before I do, just to say one more thing about our, our impression of the scale of, of this habitation. The trees that were cut down in order to build these structures were planted 20, 30 years prior to the structure going up, and they're coming from managed woodland. So these are uprights all the same diameter, they're oak trees, okay? So this is not something that's sort of ad hoc and gone up in some sort of, I don't know, fit of peak and things. This is something that's part of a formal occupation of this landscape. The other thing to say is that the species of trees being used in this destruction are coming from a terrestrial woodland. So though we're in a wetland context, they are oak and ash. So there are managed woodlands up on Peterborough and Whitsey Island and places like that. And when we look at the faunal assemblage, the animal boats from this settlement, the old idea was we'd expect to find, I don't know, pike and perch and eels and, and the, the sort of fish and fowl of, of Fenland. In actual fact, what we find is sheep, pig, cow, horse, dog. And when we look at the plant remains, it's barley and wheat. So these guys, for all of their, their wetland situation, their personality is still very much terrestrial. 
So it sort of flipped on its head our mm. own impression about what was going on with settlement within this region. Yes. yes. This is the roof that you have in this case. Was it the same condition on the other three? Pretty much, yeah. Could you repeat the question? Yes. Yes, so uh, the question was, is, you can see the roof in this quadrant, but it was also, it was once also all the way around the building. So we've removed parts of the roof in order to see what was underneath it. So in effect, we are perhaps in that sort of fantastic position of being the first archaeologist in sort of Britain to actually walk inside a Bronze Age round house and actually start to re-articulate that, that pattern. Because of about the preservation, because presumably it's all going to decay now, it's taken out of that damp. Ah, yes. Preserve we preserve it by keeping it damp, by keeping it wet, and our programme at the moment is to, to lift, to record, and to conserve. So we will take all the main structural elements of this building and, and basically preserve them for, for the future. Somewhere else. Somewhere else, yeah. And how are you recording it in terms of... I mean, what's the kind of digital record? Okay, good question. Um, we're photogrammetry. Yeah. Um, yeah. We, we photograph, we digitise, we bring the plans down, we annotate yeah. and they go back up again. Yeah. We have a complete three-dimensional record of this site. You can almost fly through the, the timber mass yeah. and things and yes. see it in its entirety. Yeah. So, and that gives us a, a rapidity mm. that it suits this material. We need to be fast because, as you suggest, it decays all the time. So mm. we're spraying, recording, lifting, and then moving on and trying to get through the entire site. And it's that intensity and that articulation that a, as archaeologists in this country, especially, we're not used to for prehistory. This is the sort of things that our colleagues on the sort of Alpine lake villages and things like that were, are used to, mm. and we're now getting to experience for the first time. Mm. I want to show you a discovery that came up last week. If I can back up this one. small groups down here, um, so maybe sort of groups of four and five. Mm -hmm. It looks like wheels that are found in northern Germany, Denmark, Holland, same period, late Bronze Age. And it adds to that, that overall image, I think, of this sort of schizophrenic sort of relationship between the wetland and dryland. Because, you know, this wheel is no good for driving around in rivers. This is from that dryland context. So it's that connection being played out through the materials. And the other thing to say about this wheel is that it's also charred. It was caught in the same fire event. So we imagine it was hanging up on a wall in one of these structures, it catches fire and it joins everything else in this sort of mass of, of, of the destruction or the conflagration and that, that sense of, there's something very compelling about this excavation because things look like they're in situ but they're not quite, they were once up here and now they're all down there. So our job as archaeologists is to, is to, is to uncover, to understand and almost sort of try and put them back up into their positions up here again. So. It's a tripartite wheel. It's, um, so there's a, there's a central panel, two side panels. There's a dovetail brace across here. There's one on the other side. And there are these two sort of half moon shaped holes either side. And there appears to be the axle still sticking out of the, of the centre. The axle is made of oak. We think the wheel is potentially made of older, but we don't know that yet. But it looks like some of the, the other trees around here that are made of that species, so, or bits of wood around here that are made of that species. Mm. I'm just asking, but were they here because they were um, fishing and then trading the fish, or was, or was this their kind of permanent way of living? Have we got any idea of that? We thought they were here because they were fishing, but there's no, the fish record from this level is very, very poor. I think they're here because this is the, the motorways, the waterways are the connections with the rest of this landscape and also with the continent. I think they're also out here because it's a place that you can defend, you can separate yourself from the sort of the rest of the world as well. So it's a combination of those things. Can we bring some other people down as well?
Well, there's another one of those on the reverse on that side. 